Rome is full of beautiful monuments like this one. But in a cash-strapped Italy, who picks up the bill to protect and preserve them? Coming up on The Travel Show, we find out how time is taking its toll on the eternal city and how some big names in fashion could be coming to the rescue. Chris de Larwood goes behind the scenes at a controversial exhibition in Germany to take an anatomy lesson. In Animated Tales, we meet a heroic stranger. And if you enjoy taking a mud bath, we'll have some tips on where to book your next holiday. Hey, hello and welcome to The Travel Show with me, Adia Depitan. Now this week, I'm in Rome, the eternal city. Well, this year marks the 2000th anniversary of the death of one of ancient Rome's most popular and famous emperors, Augustus. And he's the man who historians say brought peace and prosperity to the Roman world, which was filled with centuries of infighting and bloodshed. And two millennia after his death, Rome has finally decided to tidy up his tomb. At times, it feels like Rome is more like an open-air museum than a city. It's so full of monuments, statues and buildings from its imperial past. Every year, around 12 million people come here to see what's left of the splendour that once made ancient Rome the capital of the known world. And much of that success is down to this man, Augustus, who hugely expanded the empire when he became Rome's first emperor in 27 BC. He's gone down in history as the man who secured Rome's path to superpower status. And like every dictator, he wanted his capital city to be the grandest and most impressive in the world. Many of the monuments he instructed to be built here still stand to this day. But some have fared less well than others, like his once lavish family mausoleum. For years it's been laying derelict, desperate for some care and attention. But as Italy fights to save its economy and pay its bills, the restoration and preservation of its sites like these have suffered. It's hard to believe that in its heyday, these walls were three times higher than they are now, and they were covered in white marble. But over the years, that marble has been stolen, and this place has been literally left to fall apart. But things are about to change. Now, 2,000 years after Augustus's death, 2 million euros of public money has finally been made available to kickstart the cleanup before the site reopens to tourists in 2016. What were your thoughts when you were told that the money was secured and, and you would be able to restore this mausoleum? We wait a long time to have this opportunity and so, so for us it's very important to have the first step of this way and also it's very important uh, to consider this monument as universal uh, heritage. But while two million euros will help, far more money is needed to look after sites like these. And with the country's national debt running into trillions of euros, the government has had to come up with another approach to protecting Rome's past. My vision uh, would be impossible uh, to do all the things that we need to do in order to keep the value of our monuments because we are the center in Italy of uh, an incredible uh, economical crisis and uh, you know I, mm, I have the responsibility to uh, take care of uh, a lot of a social emergency and uh, I really need to look uh, somewhere else in order to gather the resources. And this new funding model appears to be paying off. In 2012, the stonework on Rome's Trevi Fountain, famously featured in Federico Fellini's La Dolce Vita, needed some serious attention to save it. 
And thanks to a €2 million Euro cash injection from the fashion house Fendi, fronted by Karl Lagerfeld, there's now money available to maintain this iconic masterpiece. Similarly, the Spanish steps were rescued by luxury jeweller Bulgari. And Rome's most iconic building, the Colosseum, hasn't been immune from the funding crisis. The 2,000-year-old monument has been in need of restoration for decades and in a controversial move, the billionaire Diego de la Valle stumped up the money to fund the project. A shoe manufacturer, a very wealthy, very nice man named Diego de la Valle, mm -hmm. contributed something like $40 million. He said recently to me, it took me four years and three different cabinet ministers to get that accepted. Why? Because many of the Italian, some of the best uh, art historians and archaeologists feared that there would be too much blatant publicity. But should the future of buildings that have stood for 2,000 years rest on the whim of a fashion designer or luxury global brand? And how long before their logos start appearing on walls like these? I think that, that it is inevitable that that will happen but it must be carefully governed. Indeed, some donors have asked for recognition for their contributions, but so far they've been minimal. The Japanese investor behind the renovation of the Pyramid of Cestuous has asked for a small plaque bearing his name, and Fendi has requested a similar gesture on the Trevi Fountain. But the mayor of Rome insists that billboard advertising is not part of the plan. So will we expect to see shoes advertised no, all over no, the No, 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 no. Actually, this, the, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that you raised this point because uh, we are looking for pure uh, uh, philanthropic help. So there will be no advertisement on the Colosseum and the same will happen for the Trevi Fountain. We have the responsibility to keep all these and to give the proper uh, uh, resources in order that uh, generation generation after us will continue to enjoy this incredible archaeological richness. Well, if you're planning a trip to Rome anytime soon, here's some travel show tips to help you get the most out of your time there. Make sure to plan ahead for popular tourist attractions and you can reserve tickets to sites like the Vatican Museums online to stop you from queuing for ages. Optionally, you can invest in a Roma Pass which permits entrance to sites like the Colosseum and Roman Forum and gives you free access to public transport as well. Rome is known as the City of Seven Hills and there are several places where you can admire the city from a height but maybe the best panoramic views can be found on Janiculum Hill, which lies west of the river Tiber and outside the ancient city. If you're in Rome to see the Pope, then get yourself to St. Peter's Square on a Wednesday morning when Pope Francis gives blessings to pilgrims and tourists. An audience with the Pope consists of small teachings and readings in many languages. Arrive early if you can. And finally, no trip to Rome is complete without local food. Many tour operators offer food walking tours that introduce you to the best local culinary spots. And if you'd like to take a taste of Italy home, maybe perfecting your pizza tossing skills, why not try a cookery class? Next up, our animated adventure this week comes from Morocco, where a tourist gets swept into the sea. Sometimes you agree to go on holiday with people you don't really know and sometimes these people drink too much on the first night. My husband and I found ourselves on such a holiday in Morocco where a friend of a friend, let's call him John, had a place at a beach resort in Asila. John insisted on taking Asila's nightlife by storm and the next day, even though he looked like he could have used a nap, continued to amp up the activity level with a bout of windsurfing. This is a vacation after all, why relax? But when he jumped onto the windsurf board, he was immediately swept about 300 metres offshore and then the mast snapped. My husband and I couldn't swim out to help. He's not a strong swimmer, neither am I. So we watched with increasing dread as John was rapidly swept further out to sea. Crowds gathered on the beach and began to get rowdy 
If he doesn't drown, the sharks will definitely get him. Come here, there's a guy drowning. The hotel offered to call in a lifeboat from Tangiers. Theirs was broken. Tangiers was over an hour away. Suddenly, Morocco's version of Arnold Schwarzenegger parted the crowds with his rippling muscles and proclaimed, I watched a guy die here last year. I can't let that happen again. And in he dove, swimming towards a small dot that John had become on the horizon. He seemed to swim for hours, stopping only briefly to catch his breath, and began pulling John back onto the broken windsurfer. As they came onto shore, the previously cutthroat crowd was cheering and crying. The lifeboat from Tangiers had just arrived, the crew basking in undeserved glory. Turns out Moroccan Arnold was a professional bodybuilder on vacation from LA, and if he hadn't weighed 300 pounds, we'd have lifted him onto our shoulders and paraded him through the Medina. A new bus system has opened in Rio de Janeiro, just in time for the start of the World Cup. The trans Carioca bus corridor runs for 39 kilometers from Galeo International Airport to Barra de Tejuca in the southwest of the city. At full capacity, the system is expected to carry 450,000 passengers per day, although some of the stations are yet to be completed. But the project has met with some resistance, with campaigners protesting against the system's $700 million price tag. If you're planning a trip to Russia, be aware that the country has now introduced a smoking ban in all public places. As of this week, it is illegal to smoke in bars, restaurants, hotels and trains, with owners threatened with fines if a customer is found to have flouted the law. And finally, Chicago's tallest tourist attraction has reopened after workers were called to repair its shattered floor. The ledge on the 103rd floor of Willis Tower is a series of glass boxes from which visitors can look down at the city below. A spokesman said it was only the protective coating that had shattered, posing no danger to people inside the box. Three thicker layers of structural glass underneath remained intact. Still to come on the travel show. From sardines to mud baths, our global guide Michelle rounds up this summer's hottest events. Welcome back to The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Hello, I'm Michelle Yana Chan, your global guide with top tips on the world's best events in the coming month. From fashion forward Antwerp to a feeding frenzy off the South African coast. Don't get me started but first to Belgium. From June 12th to 14th, it's the coolest, hippest fashion show on the planet. Students at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp will be showcasing their creations at the Wagnertier in Belgium's port city. It's considered the place to discover emerging designers of the future. Thousands come to check out the students' collections. Cute, quirky, sometimes crazy, and definitely never ready to wear. Across to the US, where the Firefly Music Festival will be rocking the state of Delaware from June 19th, 
Set in the woods of the Dover International Speedway, this year's lineup features the Arctic Monkeys, Foo Fighters, and the Lumineers. There's a hammock hangout, a gaming arcade, and the treehouse sessions with up and coming bands playing high in the treetops. Now, embarking on this trip is a bit of a gamble, but it's one worth taking. The sardine run in South Africa doesn't happen every year, and its exact location is never certain either. But take a risk and head to the wild coast of the Eastern Cape, when around now millions of sardines stretching for kilometres can be found swimming along the KwaZulu-Natal coast, followed in hot pursuit by diving gannets and cormorants, as well as seals, dolphins and sharks preying on the massive shoals. The run can be witnessed from a boat, but the brave will take to the water and snorkel or dive amid the fray. In East Africa on June 28th, the Safari Car Marathon takes place on Kenya's Lua Wildlife Conservancy. This is one of the world's toughest marathons at an average altitude nearing 2,000 metres above sea level. Entrants vary from walkers and amateurs to Kenyan internationals. That's intimidating. The marathon raises funds for local communities and wildlife conservation projects across the country. Back to Europe, where it's time to pull out your face paints. At the end of June, Austria hosts the 17th World Body Painting Festival in Vortesi in Corinthia. Artists from across the globe will compete for the title and there'll also be workshops for novices and a kids' programme. Highlights include the Electronic Picnic on July 4th and Atlantis, the hidden city of underground music the following day. For a different kind of body paint, take a trip to South Korea, hosting the Boryong Mud Festival from July 18th. Held at Daecheon Beach, visitors can mud wrestle, mud slide, or take part in the mud marathon. There's also a chance to relax in the mud massage zone. Organizers say the mud itself is more than just fun. It's also good for your skin and health. Although I'm not sure that's why most attend. That's my global guide this month. Let me know what's happening in the place where you live or where you love. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and email. Until next time, happy traveling. Finally this week, a behind the scenes look at the biggest traveling tourist attraction in the world. And it's not for the faint hearted. In fact, take this as a warning. Some of what follows is pretty grisly. With some trepidation, Krista traveled to the border of Germany and Poland to meet the human exhibits of Body Worlds. These are hard economic times in the little town of Guben. Since German reunification and the collapse of the textile and hat making industries here, unemployment has hovered around 20%, almost four times the national average, and the population in the last quarter century has almost halved. What this place needs is an economic saviour. So what better than to become the headquarters of a global tourism phenomenon, one as fascinating as it is macabre. Since it first launched in 2004, Body Worlds has attracted more than 38 million visitors worldwide. Crowds pay handsomely to see preserved human and animal bodies artfully displayed, with exposed bones, muscles and arteries, or thinly sliced into cross sections. But it's at this old factory that Body Worlds has made its home. This is where many of the bodies, all freely donated of course, undergo the process of plastination. That's where fat and water are removed and replaced with silicon so the bodies can be preserved indefinitely. The plastinarium, as it's known, has provided 60 full-time jobs and is now among Gubin's biggest employers. For tourists, this place offers an utterly unique attraction. Not only can they wander through a permanent exhibition, but they can see teams at work in the dissection room. And those with strong stomachs can, believe it or not, take up a scalpel and join in. 
I'm glad to be wearing this. I think this is a good idea. Some visitors are more enthusiastic than others, it must be said. The doctor shows me how to remove connective tissues to reveal muscle fibres, which will eventually be displayed. It's a very strange and disquieting experience, and I'm mainly trying to keep my hands from shaking. What's interesting to me uh, is that tourists actually are able to come and participate in this. People are getting excited uh -huh. yeah, to try to dissect the body. Because that's only the opportunity for lay people to try to work with the real anatomical, real human tissues. For me, this raises questions about the ethics of allowing tourists to get so hands-on in this process. Of course, wherever Body Worlds tours, controversy tends inevitably to follow. It's an easy topic uh, where people might be scared, not knowing what actually is behind what we do. So I think this is what showed here as well. Initially there were, when my father decided to come here and we came here, yeah, a lot of questions and, and, and maybe even protests when we opened up here. But yeah, the longer we are here and people can come in and see what we do, uh, the less I hear about that. The process of plastination was developed by the man nicknamed Dr. Death, Dr. Gunther von Hagens. Now at the age of 69, he's living with Parkinson's disease and is handing over control of body worlds to his son, Rurik, among others. Perhaps not surprisingly, Gunther is often asked if he will one day donate his own body to the exhibition. Of course, I will be donating my body. I already did so many years ago, and I think I'm, my whole person life is dependent on body donation. So it's, it's a matter of course that I give my body in, but in order to make this place here more popular, I will be named. Giraffes climbing trees, a parade of horses' heads and an elephant hiding in an outhouse. It looks very much like the animal kingdom is going to provide rich pickings for body worlds in the near future. In fact, Dr. Van Hagen says his last unresolved ambition is to see a blue whale plastinated. I think he's going to need a bigger warehouse. Possibly not everyone's idea of a fun day out, but if you're interested, their next exhibition is animal themed, and it opens in Ludwigsburg, Germany, later this month. So that's your lot for this week. Coming up next week, Join us in Japan, where Carmen celebrates the 50th anniversary of the world's first high-speed trains. And, stop watching hand, she goes behind the scenes with their high-speed cleaning crew. It's amazing how quickly these cleaners work, but it's not just about cleaning. If they take longer than their allotted time, this train could be late. And believe me, that's not an option here in Japan. So join us for that if you can. And in the meantime, don't forget, we are all over social media. Our website's definitely worth checking out. And you can find details for that on your screen now. But from me, Adia Depitan, and the Travel Show team here in Rome, it's ciao, a presto.